welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom, the best the king has to offer. Today's topic is Living Epistles of the Kingdom. Living Epistles of the Kingdom has everything to do with born-again believers' spiritual maturity and growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Too many Christians are not experiencing the abundant life Jesus promised because of their lack of spiritual growth. The problem, however, is that Christians either don't know how spiritual growth occurs or they refuse to allow it to occur. Hopefully, the message of this podcast will motivate and educate you in the essential elements of kingdom living so you can grow into a mature spiritual adult, one who consistently aligns his or her life under God and his kingdom agenda, a living epistle of the kingdom read by men. This should be our natural way of life. Let's read what the Apostle Paul says concerning the saints as epistles of the living God known and read by all men. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Apostle Paul's successful ministry is proof that people's lives were being changed. Paul saw the spiritual maturity of the saints, that they were epistles of Christ, ministered by him and other apostles. Nothing is more delightful to faithful ministers or more to their praise than the success of their ministry, as shown in the spirits and lives of those among whom they labor. The law of Christ was written in their hearts, and the love of Christ shed abroad there. Nor is it written in tables of stone, as the law of God given to Moses, but on the fleshly tables of the heart. Not fleshly, as fleshliness denotes sensuality. In other words, their hearts were humbled, and softened to receive this God impression by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul ascribes all the glory to God. The Greek word used to denote epistle here is epistole, a written message, which means to enjoin by writing and to communicate by letter for any purpose. Now, a more detailed explanation of epistole comes from the Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. Vine says that epistole is primarily a message to send to. Epistle is a less common word for a letter. A letter affords a writer more freedom, both in subject and expression, than does a formal treatise. A letter is usually occasional, that is, it is written in consequence of some circumstance which requires to be dealt with promptly. An epistle, on the other hand, has a general aim, addressing all of a similar nature whom it may concern. It is like a public speech and looks towards publication. Hence, a living epistle of the kingdom read by men. Kingdom living is inclusive of spiritual growth. But before we can begin to build a solid biblical understanding of spiritual growth, we need to clear away the rubble that can come from confused thinking. There is an enormous amount of confusion on this matter of how Christians grow spiritually. For example, some people view spiritual growth as primarily a matter of learning the correct biblical information. This group believes that if you attend church and Bible study regularly, read enough books and attend a few Christian seminars, then growth in Christ will automatically follow. However, studying the Bible and accumulating knowledge can actually lead to spiritual dryness and stymie growth when that head knowledge is not accompanied by inner spiritual transformation in response to God's truth. Spiritual maturity is not contingent on book knowledge. It's entirely contingent on your relationship with the king. Other saints believe that spiritual growth is the result of following a well-defined process. 
They want to know the 10 steps to spiritual growth or the five keys to achieving maturity in Christ. I'm not saying there aren't some clearly defined stages or steps in our spiritual growth. The problem is when we try to reduce a living process to a mechanical list of steps that everybody has to follow. People simply don't grow at the same rate. So a one-size-fits-all approach to spiritual growth won't work for everybody. It won't fit everyone. Still another misconception about the nature of spiritual growth is important to mention because it has a long history in the church. This group is convinced that spirituality is achieved by what you avoid rather than what you do. These are people who work hard to give up certain things. They deny themselves certain pleasures and abstain from certain activities. Apostle Paul says that this misconception of the nature of spiritual growth is simply the doctrine of men which has no value against restraining your flesh. Let's read that from Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. There you have it. If you have ever tried to grow spiritually using any or all of the methods I just related to, believing that they will help you grow spiritually, then you have probably experienced some degree of frustration in your desire to grow in Christ. There is some truth in all of the methods mentioned. But the Bible's teaching on spiritual growth is bigger and more exciting than a list of do's and don'ts. It is imperative that every born-again believer grow spiritually. First of all, it's God's command and therefore His will for us. And second, the alternative to growth is stagnation and eventual retardation. Failing to grow is not an option for believers whose desire is to please God. Spiritual growth is transformation. It is the process by which we allow the indwelling Christ to increasingly express himself in and through us, resulting in a greater capacity on our part to bring God greater glory, be a blessing to others, and advance his kingdom on earth. Spiritual growth involves more of Christ being expressed in your life and less of you. We're growing spiritually when more of Jesus is being expressed through us than us ourselves. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter said, As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. This is one of the best one-sentence descriptions of spiritual growth you'll find in the Bible. We may not know exactly how spiritual growth works, but this verse helps us because it compares spiritual growth to physical growth. The issue of a newborn baby is the development of the life he or she has been given. Spiritual growth is not first and foremost a program or a curriculum, but the nourishment and development of a life. The goal of spiritual growth is to feed the life you were given by the Holy Spirit at the moment of your conversion to Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 14 through 15 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. The point is that your spiritual DNA is complete because you received the life of Christ at your conversion, and nothing can be added to Christ. Our challenge as Christians is to maximize what we already have, not run around and look for that which we don't. Plus, we must realize and understand that spiritual growth demands relationship. The spiritual application of this physical truth is the importance of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's interesting that Jesus did not say, I have come to give you my program, but rather, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So, if we are not growing as we should, even though Jesus came to give us not just life, but abundant life, then maybe it's because we have chosen to focus on the program rather than the person. Spiritual growth is progressively learning to let Christ live his life 
through us. And that only happens by relationship. God wants us to know the power of grace and knowledge where spiritual growth is concerned. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Let's be sure we understand that our growth is not in the grace and knowledge of a program, a denomination, a kingdom alliance or association, or anything else. Our growth is inextricably connected to the person of Jesus Christ, the one whose life flows through our spiritual veins. The supply of grace and knowledge we need comes from him. Let's explore these two elements of spiritual growth, grace and knowledge. Grace is all that God is free to do for you based on, watch this, the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. It is God's inexhaustible supply of goodness whereby he does for you what you could never do for yourself. The truth of grace seems to get lost so often when it comes to how we grow in Christ. And that may be true because growth suggests effort on our part, while grace is a gift that can only be received and enjoyed, never earned. Peter told us to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have the word of God to learn from and the Holy Spirit as our teacher. In other words, we have everything we need to put the ingredient of knowledge to work in our lives. Our goal is to know Christ, not just know about him, You can put the Bible in an honored place in your home and yet not know the Savior it speaks of. Knowledge is an ingredient of spiritual growth, but it is knowledge of a person that we must seek. Information about the Christian faith is critical because our faith has specific content, but it is also critical that this information gets connected to the living reality of Jesus Christ. So if you're serious about spiritual growth, the driving force must be pursuing a living relationship with Christ, which is deepened as you get to know him better. Spiritual growth has a purpose. Its purpose is designed to lead to an end result, which is the glory of God. After instructing us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, the apostle Peter wrote, to him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. This sounds to me as if God takes his glory very seriously. He does, which is why he wants you to seek him, know him, and grow in him, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because you want to be a person through whom he can express himself and display his magnificent glory. The Greek word used to denote glory in 2 Peter 2.18 is doxa, which means very apparent, dignity, glory, honor, praise, worship. Remember, The goal is to expand and increase your capacity to bring God glory. You need to understand that God exists for his glory. Once you grasp this truth, it will revolutionize your entire approach and attitude towards spiritual growth. Many Christians are not growing, even though they desire a closer relationship with Christ and are doing things to facilitate this relationship. The problem is that their emphasis is on them and what they are doing instead of focusing on God and his glory. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. God is saying that he created mankind for his glory. The Hebrew word used in that scripture to denote glory is kabod, which means very heavy, weighty, splendor, abundant supply, and great in quantity. This issue of our bringing glory to God is so important that the Bible defines sin as a failure to bring God glory. Romans 3.23 supports my bold statement, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is, we are not sinners just because we do bad things, but because in our sin we fail to live up to the purpose for which God created us which is to glorify him. When we glorify God, therefore, we are saying that he is a person of great value. We attach weight or importance to him. Glory also has to do with the weight that something attracts attention by the way it shines. So glorifying God means that we draw attention to him and promote him as worthy of all praise and adoration. We are the visible manifestation of God's glory on earth. 
so that the world might see and be drawn to him. We glorify God when we reflect his character. To advance God's kingdom agenda is to bring him glory through serving his purpose and reflecting his rule through our lives. The reason so many of us believers are struggling in this area of spiritual growth and having a limited impact in the world is that we want God to bless our agenda rather than us fulfilling his agenda. We want God to okay our plans rather than our fulfilling his plans. We want God to bring us glory rather than us bringing him glory. But it doesn't work that way. God has only one plan, and that is his kingdom agenda. We need to find out what that is so we can make sure we're working on God's plan and not ours. What I'm talking about here is a radical decision and passion to live as an epistle of God's glory. Once you decide in your heart that you're going to be consumed with God's glory, your whole life will be pointed in this direction. When you learn to walk as a living epistle of the kingdom, then kingdom benefits accompany your spiritual growth. Spiritual growth includes God's greater good for us. Jesus had something power to say to Apostle Peter concerning the benefits and rewards of giving your all to grow spiritually and bring glory to God. Let's read that from Mark chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Think about that promise for a minute. God is not a miser doling out tidbits to his children. It's just that benefits are of his timing and his choosing. They are not ours to demand. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. God will meet the needs of his children. Even when things happen that don't seem to be good for us, God is at work shaping and growing us in the process, no matter what the trial or the mess. I can't think of a greater benefit than knowing that God has a good purpose in everything he allows into our lives. He wants to grow us even when we are being tested and tried. If you will prioritize the pursuing and glorifying of God, he will prime you for great growth, freeing you to enjoy all the rights, privileges, peace, and power of your deepened relationship with him. And people everywhere will know that you are a living testimony, a living epistle of the kingdom read by all men. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.